In the first episode, we talked about some of the foundational principles that should guide our walk with Yeshua. And one of those main foundation points was that God desires a relationship with us. Now we can't quite have a relationship without communication, and prayer is just that. David was known as a man after God's heart. He ran after God in his life with constant prayer and worship, and it was personal. Read through the Psalms and you'll see he was honest about the ups and downs and poured out his heart to God in each moment. The Psalms aren't just songs David wrote, but prayers to God, and many can give us great insight into what a healthy prayer life looks like. Think through the scriptures about the patriarchs' prayer lives. Elijah prayed and fire fell down. Moses would just sit in fellowship with God, receiving instruction and connecting as a friend. Exodus 33 describes this. So Adonai spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Again, the key point, God spoke with Moses as a friend. That's the desire he has for you too. But you might be thinking that those relationships are only for a select few, like Moses and Daniel, and that God doesn't really care to hear my voice and the issues I'm dealing with. Don't be fooled by the typical attitude in the world today. This relationship is not just for the great ones, but for all who call on his name. Before Yeshua came, this close relationship was rare. There were some select holy people who had that connection nobody else could get. But Yeshua opened the way for us. In Him, we can talk to the Father, we can have prayers answered, and in His name do amazing wonders even greater than the prophets of old. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews also addresses this concept as it explains how Yeshua became our High Priest and made the way for us to connect with God. Let's go back to David again for some deeper insight on prayer. In one of his Psalms, David said, May my prayer be set before you like incense. David was connecting this with part of the service of the tabernacle. His house was always designed to be filled with this fragrance. God loves to hear your prayers. And just like we love to smell a nice fragrance or light a candle to freshen up a room, our prayers according to God are collected for his delight and enjoyment. In Revelation, the prayers of Yeshua's followers are described as bowls of incense going up before him like a pleasing aroma to God. This picture also shows how God treasures our relationship. These aren't words that fall to the ground, but words that are heard and valued by God. But in the same line, there's some fragrances that we love and others that we can't stand to smell. There are certain prayer behaviors and heart motivations that really stink. Just like for us, when we're looking for love, sometimes people can put on a show or say things they don't mean. It kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. The same can be said of our prayer life to God. What would it look like if you applied the same typical attitude many have towards prayer to your relationship with your wife? <laughs> it might look something like this. watching that. Girl, we need to talk. Okay. Baby, I know I wasn't giving you the attention you deserve lately. Wow, you really mean it? I do. From now on, I want to always share my heart with you. You have no idea how happy I am to hear that. I really miss the conversations we used to have when we first started dating. Sure. So, here's what's on my heart. Ready? Yes! I want you to clean my house, cook more meals for me, learn the rules of football, because I'm tired. Wait, what? I thought you were going to share your heart with me. Yeah, girl. That's what's on my heart. No, I wanted you to share how you feel about me. How I feel about you? Yeah. Why do you want to be with me? Why you find me special? Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> you stay right there, okay? Okay. Romantic things all girls like to hear. I found 10,000 cheesy pickup lines. 
Girl, your hair is like a flock of goats. You're just reading that from your phone. I am a person. You do not read lines to me from an internet quote. This is not speaking from your heart. What to do when you read dope romantic lines to your girl and she says she's a person and you're not speaking from your heart? Hey buddy, you're on your own this time. I think one principle that you can use that's really practical is, if it's not good enough for you, then why would you offer it to God? Nobody would put up with such a self-centered and one-sided relationship. Why would we think that God would want the same? Yeshua lays down some key points here in Matthew chapter 6. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Amen, I tell you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you. And when you are praying, do not babble on and on like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. First, be humble in your prayers. The purpose of prayer isn't to show how religious you are. The intention should be connecting with God. We see the example of Daniel and others. They had a consistent relational prayer with God. Daniel went home and not out into the streets to be seen by everyone. Prayer is the means by which we get to know God. And authentic prayer involves all of our heart and mind. So where do I start? In the Siddur, I have the list of prayers to pray. If there's a problem, there's a prayer for that. But as we were mentioning earlier, our goal is to connect in a deeper relational prayer with God. So what do we do? Yeshua gave us an outline of how to pray. That's a big difference than just reading a Siddur. The Siddur is a beautiful book with over 50% of the book directly quoting scripture. While this can be a catalyst to prayer and praise, God's intent is that we are personal in our prayers to Him. When you read the prayers of David in the Psalms, you see very clearly that these prayers are a real cry from David's heart to God. It is good to pray through the Word of God, but the main focus of our prayer should be communication from our heart to God. The rabbis in the past have said, this is what you should pray, line by line. But Yeshua instead gave us an outline, a structure for our conversation with God. Note what Yeshua says. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, honored be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So instead of just chanting this prayer, we make it personal. Remember he said, in this manner you should pray, meaning that this is an outline for prayer. Let's break it down. Our Father who is in heaven, honored be your name. We should start by addressing God with honor and love. You don't approach a king casually, and the same with God. The word says, enter his courts with praise. This is how we start, and usually this will also put the rest of our prayer in perspective. But how do I praise God? It's easier than you think. Just start to list off the things you're thankful for and look around at all His creation. Being out in nature is great. You can look out at the mountains and the animals and thank God for His creativity and beauty. Even when times are tough, He's given us life and He is always with us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This section has a few layers. First, we're praying for the Messiah's return and rule over the earth, but we're also asking Him to rule in our hearts in the same order and reign as He does in heaven. This brings up another major topic that we will address in further detail in your study resources. But we believe according to the scriptures, Yeshua will return the second time to rule over the earth and set up the Messianic Kingdom. 
We pray for his return, as only he can bring peace and end all wars and suffering. But we don't just wait for Messiah to come in the future. We ask for his will to be done in our hearts and our lives now. Practically, what is that? Your family may be at odds with your faith. You may have co-workers or friends who don't know Yeshua. Our job is to be the hands of Yeshua, bringing salvation and restoration to those around us. We take this time to pray for our friends and family so that they would know Yeshua and be restored by His life. We also ask God's will to be done in us personally, that we would be about the work of His kingdom in the life He has given us. Give us this day our daily bread. This is where we ask God for our needs. It could be practical needs, money, strength to face trials, or wisdom. And look through the scriptures. God likes it when we're specific in our prayers, because when they're answered, we know more clearly that it was God who answered us. Don't just say, God help me, in general terms, but list it out and be specific. Forgive us our sins as we forgive others. Ask God's forgiveness for any sin you have committed. Sin is when we say things, do things, or desire things that are against God's will. We started the prayer recognizing God as King and giving Him honor and love. When we sin against God and fail to give Him the honor and love He deserves, we must ask for forgiveness. Traditionally, on Yom Kippur, religious Jews around the world take time on the days before to try to ask forgiveness from those they've wronged. Because there is no temple, in the place of sacrifice, they fast and pray all day for God to wipe away their sins. But it's not enough to only ask forgiveness on Yom Kippur. We need forgiveness every time we sin. The awesome thing about being a follower of Yeshua is that every day is a day for us to receive forgiveness. He is available every moment to hear our confession of sin, and through faith in Yeshua, we are reconciled and made right with God. This is a huge concept we will cover in greater detail in the next episodes and study resources. But as the prophet Isaiah said, our Messiah Yeshua was pierced because of our sins and crushed because of our sinful nature, and the punishment for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Yeshua is our atonement. The Messiah has saved us from the punishment of sin. Yeshua follows up our need for forgiveness with the line, as we forgive others. We are forgiven and brought back into relationship so that we can also in the same way be merciful to others around us. So as you ask God for forgiveness, make sure you take time to forgive anyone who has wronged you. But what is forgiveness? I think the easiest way to define forgiveness is when you come from a place of anger and resentment to a place where you love and wish the best for the person who wronged you. We have to let go of our right to get justice for what was done against us and ask God to turn their hearts to Him. This is easier to say than to do, but Yeshua can give you the power to truly forgive. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Pray for a heart that honors God so that sin will not appeal to you. Pray that you will not enter temptation through carelessness or rebellion. God's plan is to help you overcome these trials and avoid the pitfalls of life. But what does it mean to deliver us from the evil one? There's a war that starts in the book of Genesis when the serpent deceives Eve in the garden. And throughout the Bible, you can see glimpses of the spiritual battle and evil opposition. We read of Satan in the book of Job, accusing him and looking for ways to break his faith. We also see in the Gospels, Yeshua being tested by Satan and setting free many oppressed by demonic affliction. In the New Testament, it says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The good news is that God has given us power to defeat Satan and the forces of darkness. We can overcome in the name of our Messiah, Yeshua. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Return to praise when concluding your prayer, acknowledging that the kingdom and all the power and glory belongs to the Lord. Praise is one of the best ways to build your faith. After you've prayed, believe that you have received. And if you receive a gift, it's always good to thank the person who gives the gift. This outline is helpful. 
Sometimes it's hard to start your talk with God. Try this. Write out the prayer when you go to pray. Use it as a reference to keep you on track. I need this to keep my focus. Some people use their hand to remember the five points. Remember, it's a guide to help you pray, keep focused, and to know the things that are important to God, which should be important to us. This model prayer is reflected through many passages in the Bible. A blessing said after the evening Shema includes a phrase quite similar to the opening of the Lord's Prayer. Our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and establish thy kingdom forever, and rule over us forever and ever. Amen. This prayer condenses much of the heart of God for us and the world. Yeshua condenses much of the scriptures and psalms in these elements of prayer. One key ingredient to effective prayer is listening. In the Psalms, you see often the phrase selah, which can be translated to say, pause and calmly think about that. It's our job not to rush through prayer, but to spend time to listen to what he may speak. Sometimes he will remind you of things you need to pray for, someone you need to forgive or ask forgiveness from. Remember, he desires a dialogue with you. He wants to speak to you, and he will. Usually not with a voice like he did with Moses with fire and shaking of the earth, but as Elijah experienced on the mountain, it was in the still small voice. God may speak by giving you peace in your heart, by reading the Tanakh and New Testament, and with the help and leading by the Spirit of God. But how do I know I heard from God and not my own imagination? The Word of God makes this clear. First of all, what you heard must line up with what the Scripture says. The book is one of the primary ways we hear from God and verify truth. God will never contradict what he has already laid out in the Bible. In the same way, if you hear a voice saying to take something that doesn't belong to you, that would obviously contradict God's commands. We also need to take into consideration the whole teachings of God and not just pick what we want to hear in the moment. This Bible isn't just letters on a paper, but it's living and active. It's one of the most powerful tools we have in our walk with God. Beyond that, God's design is for us to grow in community with other believers. Many times we can find confirmation in our prayer when we are praying with other believers. And this principle is echoed by Yeshua when He said, Where two or more are gathered in My name, there I am also. You know, from my experience, God answers prayer in the big things and also in the small things. As an example, I can give you from my life, when I was six months old, I almost died. I was led to hospital, connected to tubes, and I was in intensive care. My parents started praying and fasting, and they actually asked the entire community of believers to pray and fast with them. The doctor said there was no chance that I was going to walk out of that hospital. But miraculously, I was healed, restored, and the fact that I'm standing here today is an answer to that prayer. Another story, I'd been writing my doctoral dissertation, and you know, poor students, we don't have a lot of money. And at one particular point, I needed to send my doctoral dissertation to California from New York. And we were praying and oh, seeking the Lord for provision. Well, every morning I would go out uh, around the the building in Brooklyn and we would just clean it. We just felt like it was a great testimony. So we would, we would actually clean the trash and the gutters around our building. And one day I looked down and I saw a $50 bill. And honestly, I looked around to see who it belonged to. There was nobody. And so that $50 ended up being how God provided. And so when I went to bring my dissertation to the post office, it cost me $49.75 to send the dissertation. And so God provided almost exactly to the cent the very thing that we needed to, to actually to accomplish His will. And sometimes God answers those small, seemingly unimportant prayers. I can give you an example. One day, I really needed socks. I didn't have socks. I didn't have even the money to buy socks. I prayed to God and asked Him, God, I need socks. The next day I had a knock on the door and when I opened the door, a friend of mine stands there with a bag full of socks saying, I don't need these. Do you need them by any chance? And you know, socks might not seem important at all, 
But the fact that God heard this simple prayer and answered a specific need that I had showed me that He does care and love me and can answer even the smallest prayers. Just like with any relationship, there are universal truths. But at the same time, no love story is exactly the same. God may speak to you in a similar way that He spoke to us, but it may be different. The key is to ask and to listen, be persistent in your pursuit, invest time with Him, and you will see the fruit of your relationship bloom. We have a few practical tips in our study guide to help you get started. But the key to any relationship is the first step. Take your first step today in a life of loving God in prayer.